you know, if I was going to run a hamburger stand and you were going to run a hamburger stand and we were going to be in, in competition with each other, he would be happy for you to have any advantage in the whole world over him. But as long as he had a starving crowd, he believed that he would outsell you. Welcome to the Conversion Aid Podcast, where we help software entrepreneurs to take their business to the next level. Each week, we interview proven industry experts who share their strategies and insights to help you create software that sells. Here's your host, Omer Khan. Hey everyone, welcome to the Conversion Aid Podcast. I hope you're doing well. I am back from our family vacation in Hawaii and I'm trying to get back into the swing of things. We barely missed uh, Hurricane Kilo, which was headed towards not just Hawaii, but directly towards Kauai, which is the island that we were on. Uh, But it changed course uh, just a few days before we were leaving and I believe it's now turned into a typhoon. Um, And I can't believe it's already September. This podcast launched on September 15th, 2014. So we're just days away from the one year anniversary. Maybe I'll have to buy a cake or something. Anyway, if you haven't joined the Conversion Aid community yet, then you should go and do that right now. You'll get notified of new episodes right in your inbox, and it's a great way to learn from successful SaaS founders and entrepreneurs. Just go to conversionaid.com slash VIP and enter your email address to join. So with that, let's get on with the interview. Okay, today's guest is an author, marketer, and reality TV pilot host. He's the author of the book, Feed a Starving Crowd, which features more than 200 marketing strategies to help you find hungry customers. The Huffington Post called him one of the most influential online marketers across the globe, and Startup Australia named him as one of Australia's top 50 entrepreneurs. In this episode, we're going to learn exactly what a starving customer is, how you can go about finding them for your business, and some practical practical and actionable advice you can start implementing right away to help you grow your business. So today, I'd like to welcome Robert Curry. Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, before we get into that, I've got to get this out of the way. Tell me about the reality TV. <laughs> what, what, what is that you're doing there? Yeah, it's a really good project we've got going on at the moment. We filmed a pilot episode uh, in Long Beach in, in California, and it's been a really good experience. Like We turned around um, a martial arts studio in 30 days using little to no cash, which is great. And yeah, we're re- we're working now on talking to the different TV networks and you know getting it picked up for production. What do you have a kind of a working title for the show? Uh, we do. It's changed three times. So <laughs> <laughs> every, every time I um, every time I reveal the name, it gets dated and it changes again. So I'll have to we'll have to wait for the show to come out. And so, briefly, what's the premise of the show? So the show is we go into a business that's about to fail. We turn it around in 30 days using little snow cash. Awesome. So you're, you're going to become like the Gordon Ramsay of business and marketing with this, right? <laughs> the thing is, uh, that's one analogy, but I don't swear as much as Gordon, so I wouldn't do him justice. <laughs> cool. Now, I, you know, I, I always like to ask my guests what gets them out of bed. And some people like to share a favorite success quote and something that sort of really resonates with them. Other people just like to share what, what drives and insp- inspires them. So what, what, what motivates you? What gets you out of bed? Well, look, uh, the quote that really drives me is the one from Winston Churchill, where it's yeah, never give up, you know, never, ever, ever give up. And I think there's a lot of times in business where you just look at things and you're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, it was so much easier being an employee, <laughs> you know, it was just easy getting a paycheck and, uh, you know, leaving work at five and not having to worry about it anymore. So but then th- those are the tough days, but the great days are so much more rewarding than, than the tough ones. So I think really for me, being a business owner is, it's a big roller coaster. Um, but it's exciting because the, the highs are fantastic and the lows, you just work with them and you roll with the punches and you make it happen. So, yeah, that, that's the quote that quite resonates to me, that one from Winston Churchill. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And I, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, yesterday who's a, an entrepreneur and 
he was kind of talking about that as well, where suddenly he has these highs and and he thinks that, you know, everything is going his way and this is it. And and suddenly the next day, um, you know, it's kind of like, oh my God, just one little thing happened and it feels like everything's falling apart. And I was like, you know, I think it's like that for everybody. It's just, we just don't talk enough about that, right? But yeah. it's it's just kind of part of being a... Uh, an entrepreneur and and personally for you what you just said sort of resonated with me as well because I was like I have those days where I'm like why did I leave the job right it was like it was so easy you didn't have to worry about all this stuff but but then when you have those great days and and you're able to kind of pursue the things that you really care about um I I don't think I'd I'd have it any other way right it's 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 worth it in the end (laughs) absolutely all right, so uh, let's um, let's start by maybe explaining to the audience um, a little bit about uh, what exactly a starving crowd is. So, can you can you kind of like just tell us a little bit about um, the book? Um, why did you why did you decide to write that book? Yeah, well, I was inspired by uh, a piece of work that Gary Halbert had. I believe it was an article he wrote on his website a good you know, 15 years ago or so. And it was just a little story that not a lot of people pay attention to. But he said, you know, if I was going to run a hamburger stand and you were going to run a hamburger stand and we were going to be in, in competition with each other, he would be happy for you to have any advantage in the whole world over him. But as long as he had a starving crowd, he believed that he would outsell you. And that made a lot of sense to me. Um, and when I reflected back, on all the different businesses that I've worked in and ran myself, every single time that I was feeding a starving crowd or, in other words, giving the clients what they already wanted, business was a lot easier. And then when I was trying to educate the market and tell the customers what was right for them, the business was a lot tougher. And look, business is never easy, as we both know. It's always going to be hard, but it can be less hard if you're feeding a starving crowd um, than if you're not feeding a starving crowd. And and how long did it take you to – this was your first book, right? Yes. I'll um, start my second book. My so, first one was a Kindle – yeah, a Kindle ebook. Okay. And and you didn't – this wasn't self-published, right? You went through the publisher route with Feed a Striving Crowd? Yeah, this one's by Aviva Publisher, who's a boutique publisher in New York. Cool. Um, how long did it take you to put the book together? Um, it was about six months start to finish. So it wasn't like, it wasn't a five minute job or a, a book in a weekend kind of job, but you know, I, I did put a lot of thought and, and research and time into it. And what took the longest was the, the editing. So it was one thing to get the book out and done and I'm a pretty good writer. So I thought I would just give it to my editor and that would be pretty much the end of it or there'd only be some minor changes. But to my surprise, when I gave the manuscript to my editor, he came back with 350 comments, not track changes. So he didn't even track the changes. He just changed things that weren't right. But there was 350 comments of things I needed to change myself. Wow. Which wow. was phenomenal. And I'm a good writer to start with. So that, that did take a while. And I was quite angry with him at the time. But then I realized he actually did me a favor by helping it become a world-class book. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I was. Um, I, I wrote a piece for a... Um, a print magazine uh, a few weeks ago and um, sort of, you know, I, I was kind of invited to kind of go and sort of write something for these guys. And um, so I put something together and then um, <clears throat> the editor came back and said, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to change a few things. And I was like, um, yeah, okay. And um, he, he made a bunch of changes to this thing, which initially I was like, whoa. But once I read it, I was like, this is like 10 times better. Um, and I was like, why can't I just, I, why, can I get this guy to do this for me every time, every time I write a blog post or anything? So it kind of, it was a good example of just thinking about the value of like having a great editor um, can make a huge difference to anybody's writing, I think, um, no matter how good you think you are. Yeah, well, my friend Michael Drew says there's no good writers, only good editors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I believe that now. <laughs> All right. Um, so 200 marketing strategies in that book. Um, we, where, did, where did you come up with these 200? So there's, there's 227 to be specific. 
Uh, you cut me short 27 strategies. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure it said. Yeah, it's, it's like. Yeah, it, but more, more than 200. Oh, more than 200. That's what I missed. Oh, I'm sorry. I worked hard for those extra 27. <laughs> There you go. You have to give me another virtual slap for messing up on that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so 227. So, and how long? Uh, yeah. Where did you get them um, from? They're a, combi- they're a combination of the strategies that I've implemented for my private clients and also ones where I've gone out to some of the top marketing experts around the world and really drilled down into what's been working for them and to share their strategies as well. Got it. It's probably about okay. 50-50 if I had to make a guess. Okay. So, um, just, you know, I mean, in, in the context of a, a hamburger stand, a starving crowd makes, makes complete sense. But just in your own words, can you tell the audience a little bit about how do you define a starving crowd in the context of any business when food is not involved? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, well, this is another, a different food one, but um, <laughs> the, one, one of my clients is one of the world's top nutritionists. And we ran a product launch webinar for, for that client. And we had 7,991 people register to come along to that webinar um, to, to learn all about this new product that was coming out. So, you know, that's like almost a small football stadium. And that, that's certainly a starving crowd to get their hands on that information. Uh, side note, that webinar actually crashed. We, we had so many people on the webinar, we crashed the server. Wow. So that was... Uh, yeah, it was one of my greatest successes, but one of my greatest failures at the same time, quite ironically. <laughs> um, yeah, in the real estate market, I've had you know 40,000 people registered to come to live events in the last two years. So that's certainly a starving crowd. Um, I'll give you an example of what's not a starving crowd. In 2010, I started up a video production business because I saw that YouTube was starting to get some really good traction and most businesses in 2010 still didn't have videos on their website. So I thought, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to all these businesses and I'm going to tell them that I can go build videos for them. And then I'd hire some uni students to make the videos and I'd make all this money in the middle, you know, being the middleman. And so uh, it sounded like a really good business plan uh, but didn't didn't really work out that way because, you know, the price to do a video was about $5,000. And a lot of businesses said to me, Rob, you know, look, you're a good guy, but we just spent like $2,000 building our website, our whole website, and you want to charge us like $5,000 to build just a video? And so, yeah, I worked really hard that year, um, worked, you know, nine to five, then would have dinner, then would work, you know, six to midnight, um, you know, seven days a week, just busting my guts on that business. And it wasn't just me, it was my wife working double full-time as well. So we had essentially four full-time uh, hour, you know, four times full-time employee hour rates going into this business. And it didn't really dawn on me that it wasn't a starving crowd until the end of the financial year because I knew that it, we weren't going great, but I, I just didn't want to look at the numbers. I just, yeah, I just had no idea what was really happening. Just, just doing my best to try and sign up more people. And so at the end of the year, we filed our tax return. And um, the revenue for that year was $32,000. That was the revenue, not the profit. And the costs were $32,500. I think we lost $500 that year. Wow. And uh, yeah, we worked, both me and my wife, double full time. And so you know, at the end of that year, I worked out that, look, you know, I, I believe in never giving up, but if you've spent your whole, a whole year of your life and you've lost $500, <laughs> coming from a good six-figure salary uh, and no one wants what you're selling, well, then that's probably not the best business to be in. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> that's, um, yeah that's, that's, a, that's a tough lesson to, to, to swallow for anyone. Um, the, when I um, kind of came across the book, um, one of the things I read was about five reasons to read this book. And, mm. I, you know, what I want to do is I want to spend some of this time in this conversation talking about um, some some tactics and strategies that people can take away. Hopefully people won't want to go out and buy the book, but even if they don't want to do that, um, hopefully they'll take away some useful insights here that they can go and apply. Um, and I think reading the sort of going through those five reasons was uh, a really good sort of um, context setting for me as I started. Um, so I, let's talk a little bit about that before we get into specifics and, 
and sort of strategies. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that you say is that most people say you can't sell on social and they're wrong. T- mm. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so I think a lot of the advice we get given is, you know, don't be too salesy on social, uh, you know, engage with your audience, add value and things like that. And look, that's all perfectly well and good. Like I'm not saying don't do that. But the, th- the biggest mistake people make is they might just keep posting photos of, you know, flowers and sitting on the beach and, and things like that. But that stuff doesn't help you sell any more product as a business owner. And so even though you might get 50 likes or 100 likes if you put up an inspirational quote and you feel good about yourself, it doesn't make the cash register ring. And so my, my recommendation with my clients is, you know, if you want to do that stuff, that's fine. I'm not going to say don't do that. But we should be using social as a way to generate leads. And I cover a lot of those strategies in my book, exactly how to do that. And it's different for every business, depends on what you're selling. But, you know, we're we're a business, you know, and you've got to treat social like any other channel. Like social, you know, if you put in an investment into social, whether that's time or money, you need to get – so even if you just say, I'm just doing free posts and it doesn't cost me any money, well, it does because you should be charging yourself out at an hourly rate to the business. And, you know, even if your rate is quite low, like, like it, just say you charge your rate out at $50 an hour or $100 an hour to the business. Well, if you spend like, if your rate's $100 an hour that you want to earn and you spend an hour every day just typing up free posts, well, that's, you know, $100 a day over a month is like $3,000. And every year that's $36,000. So you've spent $36,000 typing in free posts and inspirational quotes. <laughs> and you know, is it is it worth is it worth thirty six thousand dollars to put inspirational quotes or you know pictures of the beach or things like that on Facebook? And it might be you know maybe that does convert to your business and turns into revenue. But my message is really like to be strategic and make sure that you are getting a return on your social media time invested. The the other points that I got from that were one is that um, the majority of the the marketing strategies in the book um, require spending no money on advertising at all. And those are things that people can can sort of get away, get started right away without having to spend any money. Um, <clears throat> you also talk about um, how um, you, you have a lot of information in there that help people squeeze every last dollar from the budget if they do have an advertising budget and how to get the most out of that. Um, and then there was also... Um, uh, a comment about that there's gold outside of Facebook and not just Facebook that I think the point you made was that most marketers uh, tend to focus on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn but uh, your, your point is there's a, there's a whole world out there of, of smaller, less known social networks that can be an incredible source of traffic, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like for example, there's... Um there's been like a new a new trend and it's called native advertising. And so what you can do essentially, like if you look on like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times or, you know, in Australia, the Sydney Morning Herald or the Australian newspaper, they've all got these online websites, right? And you can click on the articles and read them and things like that. Now, at the bottom of the articles, there's quite often some links, some recommendations of other articles that you may want to read. And so you can actually, you know, some of those articles are sponsored and you can pay these native advertising networks just a cost per click for your article to be on the New York Times or on the Sydney Morning Herald or on the, you know, um, the Wall Street Journal, any of these kind of websites where they have advertising space for native advertising. And so th- there is a huge amount of traffic. Like if you think how many people every day are reading these publications and your articles can be on there, it's a massive, massive opportunity that a lot of people just aren't even aware of and they don't know that exists. So, so let's kind of continue on that because as I, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, the, the majority of people listening to this show are um, software entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe they have a, a SaaS product in, in market or maybe they're planning to launch one. Um, and some of them may be doing some kind of – have some kind of services business as, as well. Um, so kind of thinking about those people, let's, let's say I am somebody who has a SaaS product of my own. Um, 
where would be a good place for me to start? Because, you know, when I opened up that book and looked at 200, 227 mm -hmm. um, marketing strategies, where do I start? Yeah. So I cover a four-step process and it's really important to follow the steps in the right order because if you don't follow the steps in the right order, you can do all these other things but they won't lead to any results. So essentially – the first tip is to make sure that we find the starving crowd to start with. So for example, like if you're selling software, we need to make sure like, do people even want to pay money for what you're selling? Like, can we, you know, can people, you know, do, if you talk to someone on the street and you tell them what you're selling, like, do they want to buy it if they're qualified to buy it? And are they happy to pay you money? And so essentially like we need to make sure that we've got at least $10,000 of revenue no matter what format that comes in, whether you have to talk to people on the phone or talk to them in the street or do a webinar or sell it online, no matter how you sell it. But we need that first $10,000 in revenue to work to, you know, to just determine that, Hey, okay, we've got an offer. People are happy to pay for the offer. They can use it and they like it. Okay. This works. And that's a really important step because like some businesses that are just getting started, they think, Oh, we've got to do Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Pinterest and Instagram and blogging and content marketing and, you know, blogger outreach and influencer marketing and YouTube. Like they just think we've got to do 58,000 things. But that's all well and good if you've got a proven funnel that works. But until you've made your first $10,000 in sales, you've just got to do whatever you can to get that first $10,000 in to make sure that, you know, people want to buy what you're selling. So that's the first place to start. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's let's talk more about that. So, um, you know, I, I I completely get the idea of, um, finding that starving crowd or, or I guess the way that, you know, we'd put it is just somebody who has a deep enough pain that they're ready to, to buy the solution from you. Um, but how, how do I, how do I figure out who those people are? Um, and even getting to the first $10,000 when you're starting out, um, and kind of going back to the video production business you talked about, mm. you know, it can be quite an uphill struggle. So, um, and, and I think the, the natural thing is, okay, I, I've got to figure this out. How do I do that? I don't know. Let me start doing Facebook and Twitter and Google AdWords yeah. and all of this thing. Yeah. Um, so what, what would you recommend as a good path to get okay. to that first 10,000? Yeah. So look, firstly, we need to identify what the issues are in the marketplace. Like what is the crowd starving for? And in the book I cover, I think about 10 different ways how to do this, but I can give you a couple just now because we haven't got a huge amount of time. So one thing that I did when I wrote my book, um, before like I started up this feed the and crowd business was I went to Amazon and I looked in my category and I looked at the top 100 books and I found out all the three star reviews where people were criticizing the book. And I worked out there were some really common criticisms of, of marketing books and marketing consultants. And so when I wrote my book and started to launch my marketing services, I made sure that I wasn't making those same mistakes that people were complaining about in Amazon. So if, you're, like, if your software product is like reflected in a category in Amazon, you can go look up all those books and work out what people's pains are. If, if it doesn't relate to that, um, most businesses can do that and, and that works really well. If it doesn't, well, there's a few different ways you can do it. You can you can go then and look at all the other products in the market. Okay, you can say you can write them all down, write down all the features and benefits, and then you can see if there's any gaps there. Like, is there is there one or two things that you can do that everybody else isn't doing? You know, that's what we call blue ocean strategy, um, written by the guys about ten years ago in that really wonderful book. And so, yeah, if you can be a little bit just five or ten percent different is all you need to be to get an advantage. And then like once you've got that kind of offering ready to go and you know what you're going to charge and you know what you're going to include, then the next step is really making that first $10,000 in sales. And the way to do that to start with, like if you, don't, if you want to do it in a leveraged format, you can run a webinar. And so people say, well, how do you get people to register for the webinar? <laughs> I, you know, I haven't got a list. You know, it's okay for you, Rob. You've got 10,000 plus people on your list. That's, that's great for you to say that. But, you know, I haven't got anybody on my list. And I disagree with that. You know, I say, yes, you do have a list. You've got business cards. You know, you've probably been in business in some way, shape or form for uh, quite a while now. So what about all those business cards you've collected over the years? That's a list of people. Uh, you know, what about your email address book? All the people you've emailed over the years, that's a, that's a list. What about your mobile phone contacts? That's a list. 
What about your Twitter followers? What about your Facebook people? What about your LinkedIn people? You know, out of all those different sources, even though it's not a, a beautifully formatted MailChimp autoresponder list, they are all lists in different ways, shapes, or forms. And you know, if you didn't have at least 500 to 1,000 people across all those different lists, I'd be gobsmacked. <laughs> you know, you have to across all those different platforms. And, so, and not every one of them is going to be an ideal prospect for what you're selling now, but maybe a handful are. You know, surely a handful would be. And that's where you start. So you start with your existing network. You just look through all those different platforms and then you can just send them each one of them a, a personal message saying, hey, Jim, I'm just letting you know I'm starting this new business. I'm going to run a webinar about this topic and it's next week and here, here's how you log into it. And that's how you do it. You get started manually. Okay. Okay, got it. Yeah. And um, so, so, so the idea basically is find, you know, find the people that you believe have a real problem that you can help solve. Um, uh, do, do, you know, there's certain different ways that you can do the research to, to get some of those insights. And then um, the, the most important type of validation is people spending money with you. Um, yeah. Now, obviously, that could vary because... You know, if you have a a SaaS product that is uh, focused on consumers and you're giving it away as a free product, then then maybe it's not about the revenue. Maybe it's about um, uh, who's actually signing up and actively engaging with your product, right? Not just signing up and then never coming back. Um, and I and I guess even the ten thousand dollars sounds like uh, sort of an arbitrary number, right? It, it's it's it sounds like it's more about getting to a point where you feel like there's significant enough demand to validate that you have a business here. Yeah. And the $10,000 is just a, a number that I've chosen that yeah, to me, like once you've got that kind of revenue coming in, it feels like you've got some momentum. But for other people, that might be a drop in the ocean. Say $10,000, what's he talking about? You, know, you need $100,000 before you even think about anything else. Or there might be other people that say, you know, two thousand dollars is a good start. So it's not it's not the number specifically. That's a number that works for me. But and um, and like you said, like with software businesses, depends on what your business model is. Um, you know, it might be about engagement rather than revenue up front because a lot of software businesses have a, a freemium model where you know you get a lot of people in for free and then you either introduce advertising or a premium level later down the track. So it does vary for different businesses. You are right. Okay, so that is step one, finding the starving crowd. Um, what is step two? So step two is what we call main course, and you know, with the food analogy, of course. And so with, with the main course, what we want is what we call a sales funnel that converts. So we want people to come to your website, you know, inquire somehow to be a customer, and then come out the other end as a paying customer. And so that's, that's really step two. Like once you know that someone can visit your website and go through your process and turn out the other end a paying customer, then we know that you've got the main course all set up. And that's very important because you can't scale unless you've got that in place. Okay, great. So can you, can you share uh, maybe an example of um, a, a business that, that has set up something like this and then maybe we can take those um, lessons and apply them to what that means in the software world. Yeah, definitely. So like, let's look at my, my online course for my business because that's quite easy to get your head around. So with my business, you know, people might come to my website, they might download my book and then I'll ask them a few survey questions about their business and where they're at. And then based on their answers, I'll recommend uh, a, a different like a different course for them based on what they've rec- well, based on what they've spoken about. So, for example, like if someone says, you know, I'm just getting started and I'm um, trying to make my first sales, then I might recommend like a course on how to find your starving crowd in the first place. And then if they're like already established, but their business is quite lumpy, so they might have like some good months and then some bad months, and you know, it's it's like a roller coaster up and down, up and down, up and down. They want to smooth out that revenue. Then we might look at a different one where like it's more about establishing a consistent flow of leads and sales. And then I've got other people that come to my website. They want to be more of a public personality. They want to do media, put a book out there, do public speaking, all that kind of stuff. And so that's – then I would do some training with them on how to be a public personality. And so um, 
and then so basically like what but everyone comes through the same process like they get the book then they ask get asked a survey one of the survey questions and then they they're offered a different product based on what they spoke about um sometimes like i've got an all-encompassing package that includes everything and i offer that as well and so um someone can come to my website and turn out the other end a customer once going through this process and the, you know we see that you see this every single day on the internet all over the place. So you know you might um, have you know, like a video hosting software like Vimeo. So Vimeo is free to upload and to put your your videos into. But if you want to do like a certain gigabyte allowance or you want high definition or the other features, you have to pay for that. And so Vimeo has a process where people can come in for free and they can come out the other end as a paying customer. And they know a certain percentage of people that sign up for the free one will end up being a paid customer they, and they know their numbers. And so that's where we want to get to with, with our businesses. We want to say, great, if 100 people visit the website, you know, 10 people will take up the free download or the free trial and then you know, one or two will end up being a paid customer. That's, that's the numbers we want to work through. Okay, so, so let me sh- make sure I got this straight. So typically <clears throat> the, the framework here is uh, you're building a funnel – um, that you're driving the traffic to, which hopefully is generating leads for you. And the first step of that would be, like in your example, somebody uh, signing up to get a copy of your book. Um, and then sort of behind the scenes there, you're segmenting uh, those leads based on um, the information that you derive from them. And you're using yes. a survey to do that. Um, but you could be using impl- implicit or explicit signals to figure out where that user is. So, for example, for a software product, it could be based on maybe how they're using the product or what kind of FAQ type information they're looking at might give you a sense of, you know, where they are with with their business. Um, And then you're making relevant offers to them uh, based on how you've segmented them. Um, Now, now in the the SaaS world, um, we often see they're sort of like, um, obviously, the primary call to action is um, getting people to sign up for a a software product, and um, there are all kinds of models, whether it's the freemium or uh, giving people some kind of free thirty day trial before you start charging them. Yeah. Um, you know these kinds of things, but um, you know I also often see many um, SaaS products having some kind of, I guess, lead magnet as well, um, which may be um, something as simple as, you know, an, a, a seven-day email course on whatever problem is kind of relevant to that customer. And um, I, I guess the thinking is, you know, if they're not ready to sign up, then maybe getting them onto the email list um, will help to nurture that that lead and eventually drive them into subscribing or, or signing up for the product. What's your view on that? Do, do you do you believe that that's that's kind of a good way to do it? Or yeah, um, definitely, yeah, definitely. So um, it's a, it's a very very valid way of doing things because sometimes when people get started, like they might visit your website for the first time and they might say, "Well, you know, I don't know about this company. I don't know if they're legitimate. I don't know if this is going to do what I need it to do." I'm busy right now. You know, I've got a meeting that starts in two minutes. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why people might not sign up immediately on the spot. And so, like I find with my online course, it takes an average of 9.1 visits to the website for someone to purchase my online course. I've looked at my stats, and that's what it is wow. for mine. And I've got and I've got quite a good reputation in the market, and I'm well known. So, if your business is less known, then that's that's going to be even harder again, and it might take you longer. So. Yeah, if I didn't have any email follow-up sequence, I would only make a very small fraction of the sales that I've made. So, and typically, I mean, I know, I know, you it's you know, you you don't have a software business, but um, from from the point where somebody becomes a lead to uh, the point they may become a customer, what what mm-hmm. what sort of a typical time frame for that? It does vary, but as a marketer, you always want to be trying to shorter than that time frame because naturally the faster they pay the better for your cash flow um because if you imagine that let's say for example you're doing paid advertising so let's say you're running facebook ads right and you um so you spend ad you spend your ad dollars today 
um, someone becomes a free trial, you know, and they take six months then to become a customer or 12 months to become a paid customer. Well, then you've got a big cash flow gap of six or 12 months from when you paid for that ad to when you get some money back from the customer. So naturally, as a, as a marketer, we're always looking to try and shorten that cycle when we can get paid. Yep. And so there, there's lots of different ways you can do that. Um, you know, probably the simplest way and that the easy one to get started is to make them a one-time special offer as soon as they register. So for example, like, you know, if your, if your regular price is $10, well, when they register immediately, like for the free thing, you can offer them a, a one-time offer of $5 half price. And say, look, this is only going to be shown on this screen. You'll never see this offer again. It's <laughs> now's the best time, the very best time to take it. And you need to be true to that as well. So, if if you say this is a one-time offer and it's five dollars, then they say no. Then they turn up five minutes later and it's five dollars on the general website. Well, then you're out of integrity, and yep. there's no reason for them to take that up. But if, um, yeah, if if you make a really good offer, uh, you'll find that a good like a good percentage of customers will take that up, and you can get paid a lot faster. Yeah, I, I can't remember who it was. Um, I was on somebody's list and they made an offer and, um, you know, said something like the offer expires and, you know, this weekend or something. And and I was like, yeah, right, you know, I'll just come back yeah. some other time or or I'll use a different email address or something like that. Um, and, um, you know, see the same offer again. And, you know, these days when using tools like things like Infusionsoft, you know, that's not so easy to to get around those kinds of things now. And um, and I remember like, you know, a few weeks later kind of going back and saying, oh, maybe I might be interested in that thing now. And I couldn't find that offer anymore. And even yeah. when I tried to use a different email address, it wouldn't work. And I was like, oh, my God, he was serious. He really meant it. So yeah. the, the next time I came across an offer like that, I was like, okay, no, he means it. This is a real deadline. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I ended up getting my credit card out. So um, yeah, yeah, we it, had that happen just this weekend as well. So I had um, – like I, I do webinars quite often with different partners – and so, like at the webinar, we'll make an offer to say, "Look, it's you know, you get this special discount off this off the course. Um, it's valid for the end of this weekend, and after that, you know, you can still buy the course, but it's the regular price." Because I never say I'm taking the course off the market, or you never get it because that's that's just a lie. Or, you know, it's a digital course; you can get yeah. it anytime you want to get it. But what I what I can do is offer a discount for a short period of time. And so I did that. So we had a discount to the end of the weekend. And then Monday morning, somebody emails me and said, you know, I didn't get a chance to go buy that course. Um, you know, can I still have it for the, the discounted price? And I reply back, I said, look, I'm really sorry. Like, I'd love to have you on the course, but th- that offer was just for that weekend. And, you know, the, you can, the course is still available, but it's at the regular price now. And so, you know, it would have been really easy for me as a business owner to say, you know what, you know, I could really do with that extra money. <laughs> um, you know, I should, I should take that that sale because yeah. the guy didn't go ahead with it now. So I, I lost out on that sale. But that, you know, I would have been out of integrity. And all those other people that purchased it, they, you know, if this person spoke about that or posted on social media that he got a really good deal after the fact or anything like that, then I would be completely out of integrity. And any time that I made a special offer in the future, it wouldn't work. So it's really important that if you're going to make these offers that they're in integrity because that's, that's how they work really well. Okay. Um, so that was uh, the second step, the main course. Um, yes. What's step three? So step three is dessert. And dessert is – I love these food analogies. Yeah, it's all food. <laughs> it's all food. And so dessert is when you can pay for an ad and they can go through that funnel and come out as a customer because it's very different for warm traffic, so people that you know already – or people that are already on your email list to go through that funnel and turn out a customer. That's, that's very different to you know, paying for an ad. Someone's never heard of you before. They click on an ad and they come out the other end as a customer. Okay, so yeah, so tell me about this more. Like why, why would somebody need to get to this point um, to, yeah. to, to pay for advertising? Um, and and you know, when does it make sense to do this? Yeah, you need to do it because... Um, that, that's how you scale. So if you just rely on warm traffic coming through, so people that know you already or people that search you or referred traffic or things like that, that's all well and good. And I, I like that kind of traffic. It's great. But the problem is, is that over a period of time, that traffic has a good chance of drying up. 
And so you're not in control of your revenue anymore. But when you pay for ads, you know that, hey, if I pay a dollar, I'm going to get a click from Facebook. I know that as a matter of fact. And so you can say, great, our budget is going to be $100 a day or whatever that $50 a day or $20 a day. And we know that we're going to get 20 clicks or 100 clicks or however many clicks that we get. And then, you know, we know our numbers. We know that 10% are going to register for a free and then one will buy at the end of that. And if you know that, then you can confidently scale up your advertising and go hard. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know where, where I got the quote from where somebody said something that um, you don't have a business until you can kind of predictably kind of buy customers or something something like that. I don't know. It, it, was, it was some kind of like direct response marketing person. But anyway, uh, yeah, I, I totally get the point, right? So, um, and, and I think I, I see that a lot with um, startups as well in that, in the early days, you don't have a budget uh, or have a lot of money to spend on advertising. So you're doing all kinds of things, whether it's just, you know, trying out kind of like no low, no cost growth tactics um, or doing content marketing. And these kinds of things um, will, you know, will definitely get the word out and eventually start driving traffic back. Um but as I've seen with some of the more uh, more established software companies, they do start spending money on advertising because they do get to that point where they realize that if they don't do that, um, they're not going to be able to scale. And um, uh, they become a lot more clearer about exactly what you said. You know, this is our customer acquisition cost. Um, this is how much for every, you know, X number of dollars we spend, we're going to get a customer. Uh, this is the... This is the lifetime value of that customer and how long we expect them to be a customer and how much money they'll spend during that time. Um, and so then when you're in that situation and, and sort of the economics of that thing makes sense, you wouldn't have a problem spending $100,000 on advertising if you know that's going to convert to $200,000 worth of revenue from customers. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've had clients that have spent, you know, almost half a million dollars in one month with me on ads because they knew that they would get a, a return from that. And so you can scale up to these big numbers. And people will say to me, Rob, how do you get 40,000 people into live events and things like that? Well, because my clients know their numbers and they're very confident to, to scale. And, they, and this, they get to the last stage, which is all you can eat. And so they say, Rob, we know our numbers. Just if you put people in that room, we know we're going to sell. And so do whatever you can do to put people in that room. And the you know, same thing with the software business. Like if you've got, if you know that without a shadow of a doubt that you know, 2% of people that get a free down, like a free download or a free trial or a free account, if you know that a certain percentage of them are going then to become a paying customer, then you can confidently throw a lot of money into ads, into that, um, into, you know, getting people to take up a free account because you know that a percentage of them will end up going to the paid account. And so that's the last step, the all-you-can-eat stage. Okay. Yeah. T- tell me a little bit about what, what does that mean, all-you-can-eat? So that's where we go, all the things that are fads and fun and, and you know, good to do, then we just do all that stuff. <laughs> we, we, we try a bit of everything to see what works the best. So you can try you know, your Facebooks, your Twitters, your LinkedIn's, Instagrams, um, native advertising, public speaking, media. There's a, there's a million things we can do. And there's you know, 227 things in the book to do. So there's no shortage of things to do, but it's, um, it's knowing that once you've got that funnel in place and you know that it works from paid traffic, then we can go through the whole book and go through every single strategy in there and work out which ones are going to be the best ones to apply for your business. Okay. I was fascinated by the social networks. Um, is, is there a, a maybe another example that you can share on uh, maybe a, a social network outside of Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, which... Mm-hmm has proved to be a, a great source of traffic for you or, or your clients? Yeah, I've got some really good case studies in the book. We've got um, – there's some really good Pinterest case studies. Um, and that's – I'm very conscious of making it relevant for your software entrepreneurs. So Pinterest is more of a you – know, more of there's majority of females on there rather than men and it's more about homewares and things like that. But if you've got like um, a product that aligns with that audience, Pinterest is a fantastic way. To, to make that happen. Uh, you know, YouTube is quite underestimated. Uh, you know, a lot of people will say, um, you know, 
YouTube, you can get fantastically low, low cost clicks from YouTube. Uh, I've had some good success on YouTube. I've got some clients that are doing amazing things on YouTube because a lot of people just don't think to advertise on there. They think that, you know, it's for big brands or whatever. Um, and it's, it's a little bit harder to make it out on YouTube because you need to produce a video. So because a lot of people aren't going to the trouble to make a video, then, uh, you know, they're just not making that happen. Um, you know, uh, I've got some really good case studies about Reddit in the book. So Reddit, uh, you know, one guy ran um, like a coupon code to get a free copy of his course on Reddit and had hundreds and hundreds of people that, that took that up. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I cover heaps of these in the book, you know, SlideShare, StumbleUpon. There's some fantastic social networks out there that have very inexpensive clicks that um, are looked over by a lot of marketers. Okay, cool. Um, so just to kind of recap on that, we said step one is to find the starving crowd and to get whatever uh, validation makes sense for your business. Um, step two was the main course and building out the funnel. So you can take somebody, uh, you know, tra- from traffic uh, visitor through to uh, eventually becoming a customer or a user of your product. Um, step three was the dessert where you um, can pay for advertising and and use that as a way to to start scaling your business because now you have that funnel and you're building some predictability around how much traffic you need. You know, for every hundred visitors that I get, I'm going to get, you know, 10 leads. And of those leads, there's, you know, two are going to turn into customers. Therefore, I'm, I'm, you know, comfortable spending X dollars on those hundred visitors because I know those two customers at the end of the funnel will more than pay for that. Right. And and then sort of all you can eat is kind of looking through and, and sort of figuring out um, through the book what, what are the things that make the most sense and, and as you said, align best with your target audience. And, and I think the Reddit and the Pinterest examples are really good because if you are in the consumer space, um, most likely you're going to find a, a predominantly male audience in a place like Reddit and, and a female audience in, in Pinterest. So... Um, but those, I think those were just two good examples of, um, you know, where people can go and look. Yeah. Um, good summary. Okay. Yeah. Good. I, I'm, I'm, I was paying attention. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, so, uh, if folks want to, um, get hold of the book, um, it's, it's available on Amazon uh, or they can uh, go to your site, right? Uh, let me just check. Yes. So they can just go to feedastarvingcrowd.com and that's they can right. get a free copy of the book from there, right? Yes, that's correct. All right, let's get on to the lightning round. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I'd like you to answer them as quickly as you can. Are you ready? Okay, yes. All right. Dun, 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 dun. What's the best piece of business advice that you ever received? Uh, build in subscription revenue into your business. What's one book you would recommend to our audience and why? And it has to be something other than Feed a Starving Crowd. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, forget <laughs> it then. Let's just change it. Go to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in, in line with that subscription business model, uh, there's a book called The Automatic Customer that talks about the different ways to build a subscription business. And it's a very good book. That's cool. I had uh, John Warlow, the author of uh, The Automatic Customer, here on the show uh, a while back. And we talked about those the various business models there. Uh, I actually really loved his first book as well. Um, what was it? Built to, Built to Sell. Did you read that? Yeah, he's a smart guy. Yeah. He's a real smart guy. Yeah, I, I love that story in there because it was like a really good example of this guy running this this uh, agency, this advertising agency or design agency, and and kind of refocusing on just like a business that creates logos, right? And mm. on the face of it, you're like, that sounds like a dumb idea. But when he kind of walked through it, you were like, oh, it, it it was a really great story to hit home some powerful lessons about focusing and and I guess productizing your service. Yeah, um, absolutely. What's one attribute or characteristic in your mind of a successful entrepreneur? 
Um, well, like I said at the start, they never give up. You know, so even when times are tough, they don't give up. Um, in saying that, you don't want to be ridiculous either. So if you clearly don't have a starving crowd, then <laughs> it might be a good idea to move to something different. Well, what's your favorite personal productivity tool or habit? Uh, I've got Rescue Time that I've just recently installed. And I think that's a, a great way because you're held accountable and it really shows you how much time you're on Gmail and Facebook and things like that that are very distracting. I've got to get something like that because I'm kind of going through this, these sort of days at the moment where it's just like before I know it, the day's over. And I'm like, what did I actually get done? Um, yeah, they're the worst days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'm going to go out and get rescue time as well. Um, yeah. What's uh, a business idea that you'd love to pursue if you had the extra time? What's what's kind of one of those ideas in your head that you kind of come up with and just say, oh, if I only had the time, I'd go and do that? Yeah, I would build like a, a nice sticky piece of software, like a um, like a marketing automation system or something like that, like Infusionsoft or uh, something like that. Because those things are that it's something that people use every single day and they're generally quite sticky. Like once people use them, they, they stay around for a while. What's an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? Uh, I first started, my first business was a DJ business when I was in high school. Did, did, how, how did that work out? Um, it was good. Most of my friends were earning like $5 an hour, you know, stacking shelves um, at the supermarket. And I was getting you know, maybe $300 a night, $400 a night when I worked. So yeah, that was like 80 hours worth of, that's like two weeks of work for my friends versus, <laughs> you know, five hours playing music. Way better. Very cool. And, and finally, uh, what is one of your most important passions outside of your work? I love tennis. Yeah. I love playing tennis. Are you any good? Oh, I, I like to rate myself. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> Robert, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for um, sharing your experiences with us and, and kind of walking through um, uh, the, the lessons and sort of insights from, from the book. Um, and uh, if, you know, as I said earlier, if uh, folks want to get a copy of the book, they can get it for free by going to feedastarvingcrowd.com. Uh, and you can you can get the PDF there, or if you prefer, you can buy the Kindle version from Amazon. Um, and if folks want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, yeah, I've got a contact details on feedastarvingcrowd.com. It's all there. Cool. Uh, thanks again. Um, and, oh, you know, oh, we for- I forgot to mention, you're down in uh, Sydney, right? I am. Yeah, so so have a have a great day down there (laughs) thank you thank you our day is just getting started so it's all good yeah cool all right uh all the best take care okay nice chatting bye cheers all right i hope you enjoyed this episode you can get to the show notes by going to conversionaid.com slash nine three uh where you'll find all the links and resources that we discussed today uh if you want to get in touch with me you can email me uh, at omer, O-M-E-R, at conversionaid.com, or you can find me on Twitter at Omer Khan. Um, and don't forget, if you haven't joined the VIP list, head over to conversionaid.com slash VIP, and I will see you on the other side. Thanks for listening. Until next time, take care. Thanks for listening to Conversion Aid, the podcast that shows you how to take your business to the next level and create software that sells. But things don't have to end here. Head over to conversionaid.com slash VIP and get yourself on the free VIP list where we share special insider content and news about upcoming episodes. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you next time.